Well, thank you, Mr. Barber. It's a great pleasure to serve under your chairmanship and to uh, join two very esteemed colleagues from the other side of the House and support the advocacy that you set out very eloquently for this key sector. Uh, it's my great pleasure, Mr. Barber, to be back uh, in government as now Minister for Science, Research and Innovation at the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Uh, and it is my mission to deliver the Prime Minister's vision of the UK as a science superpower and, crucially, the UK as an innovation nation. And um, both themes that go to the heart of contributions from members already. And I just, to frame that mission, uh, I think it's worth making clear that we are already a global powerhouse in science. So what does superpower mean? Uh, well, I'm defining it as uh, the UK uh, using our science for global good to help prevent the melting of the ice caps and understand the oceans and uh, to understand space and the new frontiers. Secondly, to be a global science nation, open to people from all around the world to come and do science, which is fundamentally collaborative. Thirdly, to make sure we attract more global R&D into the UK. It's great that we're going from 15 billion a year to 20 and on to 22 on the journey to 2.4%. To get there, we're going to have to attract hundreds of billions over the next uh, 10, 20 years. I relish that prospect. I think we can do it because supply chains are global. Uh, fourthly, it means uh, making sure that we're using our leadership in science to support the values of this country as a liberal democracy and to make sure that in cyber, in AI, in all those other areas, in space, uh, these sectors are not dominated by one or two forces who may not be our best friends, but we build clubs, commonwealths, if you like, of international collaborators who share our values. Uh, the Innovation Nation piece is really about making sure that everyone in this country can benefit, which the, uh, the Honourable Member for Leicester and Sutherland have both spoken to. And it is a passion of mine that to be an innovation nation, uh, we have to move from being a service economy that is really good at science in some silos and does a bit of innovation, to being a nation where every person in this country can feel, see, touch and experience the excitement of science, but also the opportunities for careers in innovation. And I, in every speech I've said, and let me say it again, that means the windy outreaches of Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, Norfolk, dare I say it, uh, and coastal towns, left behind towns, and places that may not feel they're necessarily at the heart of the Cambridge cluster. The good news is the pace of technology and innovation means that we can create clusters all around the country, and that is my mission in this role. I want to, to congratulate my good friend, if I may say, and the Honourable Member for Leicester West, for both securing this debate, but also raising this issue, and for her tireless advocacy uh, as member for Leicester for the Leicester Cluster. Uh, Leicester is indeed an absolutely vital location uh, in the UK space ecosystem, and I want to pay tribute to the University of Leicester for their leadership, and uh, as home to the National Space Centre, we couldn't have done that. It wouldn't be there if it wasn't for that uh, leadership. The university has been hugely helpful in building the Space Engineering Apprenticeship Trailblazer Group, and the National Space Centre in Leicester is not only, as uh, she said very eloquently, driving a new generation to take an interest in the potential of space to create jobs and opportunities and to draw people into science, but it's also key to driving up and levelling up and creating opportunities in that uh, cluster. Uh, the Honourable Lady has, has set out very eloquently and powerfully the local cluster. And let me just explain the national cluster that I think we are uh, uh, on the road to developing. Um, as the Honourable Lady says, um, part of my mission is to make sure that people see the space economy as um, more than just uh, some American billionaires going into space in rockets. And as she said, this is about highlighting that space technology is fundamental to our everyday lives, Ms. Wardell. It's um, a key to our telephones, to weather forecasting, uh, to most of our banking, to most of the digital transactions and crucially to understanding Earth observation data, climate change, net zero. It's fundamental to the sustainability of our economy and society and planet. And stressing that so that people understand this isn't a sort of vanity project for one or two countries. It's actually fundamental to a modern dynamic economy is key. And the truth is that space innovations are already beginning from autonomous vehicles to wearable technology to health and life science. When I met Tim Peake, he was conducting 32 experiments in space including experiments on bone density and eye and retinal damage, both of which repair when astronauts come back, uh, giving us a real insight into those diseases and how we might prevent them. So space technology is so much more than the rockets and um, the big launches that a generation of us have grown up watching on our televisions. It's actually integrated in the economy. And uh, that's not to say the two aren't linked. And part of our strategy is to be the first 
European country to do domestic launch because a supply chain, an ecosystem, we are the Department for Industrial Strategy, means that in order for our downstream skills to grow and invest and to support uh, and to attract investment, we need to have an ecosystem. Happily give way. This point about being the first to achieve launch in Europe. I'm sure the Minister would agree with me that there's a great prize to be won here in terms of the British economy and what we can sell to the world. Uh, the Honourable Member makes an excellent point and uh, as he will know we are uh, very ambitious to make sure that we use that first launch into a low orbit, uh, polar orbit from both Scotland, Cornwall. Uh, we are in a magnificent position globally to lead in that sector and by launching we then also build the ecosystem for servicing satellites and supply and all of those uh, supporting industries that the UK is phenomenally good at. Uh, and we're using uh, satellite technology as well to support a whole range of innovations across the economy. So the NHS uh, will shortly be starting to pilot drones for medicines delivery, particularly into remote areas. Uh, and the Rosalind Franklin rover built in the UK will blast off and land on the surface of Mars. So we are a genuine space economy powerhouse. And the government profoundly recognises the importance of this. And it was my great privilege on day three, Ms. Mardell as Minister, to launch the UK space strategy. I felt a little bit guilty because it was the culmination, the summit of uh, years of hard work uh, that I was uh, simply lucky enough to be able to read out. But it has landed internationally and sent a strong signal. And that space strategy integrates, of course, for the first time, defence and civil. And I've already met with my opponent at MOD uh, to map out uh, where the MOD is investing. They've got significant allocation of space funding in this latest CSR. Uh, some of that funding will be quite rightly uh, uh, driven by primary security it, uh, issues, but some of it may, can also support the wider ecosystem. There's a, in the middle of the Venn diagram, there's areas where Bayes and MOD are working together, and then some of the strategy delivery lies principally with Bayes as the industrial strategy department. This is an exciting time, and that space strategy, we're now turning into a space plan that will set out over the next few years where we're going to invest and in what. And the space sector, Ms. Bardell, at the moment already employs 45,000 people in the UK, over 75% of whom hold at least a first degree. So this is a very high skill sector, key to the Prime Minister's vision of creating a high skilled economy and moving away from being an economy overly dependent on low wage service labour. And uh, the um, space uh, employees deliver 2.6 times the UK average in terms of productivity. So for the Treasury, this is a sector that is driving in the vanguard of UK economic growth. And that's why we're completely committed to supporting it and to supporting uh, a diverse work workforce, which the Honourable Lady Opposite rightly highlighted. And we're using the benchmarks created by the 2020 Space Census to measure that progress. The sector already directly contributes over 6.5 billion to UK GDP and underpins a further 360 billion in the wider economy. So this isn't a small sector. This is a, uh, already a substantial sector which we, in which we see substantial growth opportunity. Uh, and that's why we've set out the level of leadership and governance that we have. We've established the new National Space Council, led by the Prime Minister, to coordinate space policy. And in creating the National Science and Technology Council, the Science Cabinet on which I sit with the Secretary of State, uh, that group is designed specifically to lead a cross-government integrated approach to key technologies and sectors uh, like space so that we integrate the defence and the civil, the industrial strategy and the global um, security issues around cyber security and data se security. So we are putting in place the mechanism of government to make sure this is a cross-government uh, plan. And on the 27th of September, as uh, both honourable members have highlighted, I announced the space strategy and the ambition is very clear to make the UK one of the most attractive and innovative space economies in the world. We're in a competitive environment uh, and clearly uh, Russia, China, India all have substantial sovereign programs but there are a number of nations, Japan, Spain, Australia, Canada, France, Italy uh, and others who are all looking to be part of a global space economy, space technology economy and clearly see the UK as fundamental to that and it's on that opportunity that we want to build a, a domestic space and satellite technology cluster. We've launched the National Space Innovation Programme pilot in 2020. That was the UK's first ever dedicated fund for advancing space technology innovation products and services. And we've just announced, Ms Bardella, follow-up funding of £7 million to help 
fund 11 projects in the scheme and we'll be setting out, as I say, the next phase in our forthcoming science uh, space plan. We have made, set the ambition to be the first country to launch small satellites from Europe and we've kick-started that work with grants worth 40 million to support the work required to deliver that ambition. And as the Honourable Member for Sutherland makes clear, we're on track next year, uh, whether it's Q3 or Q4, for uh, first launch in the UK. And we see a huge opportunity, particularly for Scotland and Cornwall, uh, to be uh, at the heart of that uh, launch economy and to drive that supply chain. Uh, as both uh, Honourable Members have highlighted, uh, this sector, properly harnessed, is key to supporting the sustainable jobs uh, and opportunities for the regions in this country. It isn't all in the Golden Triangle, uh, and that's partly why we're so supportive of its potential. And it underpins modern public services as well. Uh, the Space Park Leicester is absolutely integral, turning to the point the Honourable Member laid, uh, um, made earlier. It's an excellent example of locally-led regional technology hubs. It's one that I'm encouraging others to look at. And Space Park Leicester's plans align hugely with our own to promote sector growth. And I'm delighted that the first two phases of Space Park Leicester are complete, delivered through a partnership of the University and the LEP and the Growth Deal and Research England. Honourable Members made some really important points I wanted to touch on. The Honourable Member for Leicester uh, on skills and inclusive growth. And I, I say this as the now having to stand down former chair or co-chair of the all-party group group for inclusive growth. Uh, and she's absolutely right that if we're going to create an economy where a new generation can see new opportunities, we need new sectors that will create opportunities in new places. And that higher level vocational qualification piece is key. I've already met with, uh, my, um, with the Minister for uh, Higher and Further Education at Department for Education and with the Secretary of State to highlight that skills are one of the key barriers to cluster growth and one of the key opportunities for the government and we will be pursuing that and looking to make sure we tackle that career path. She also made a very important point about the power of the space economy to attract a new generation of girls actually and, uh, and boys into uh, STEM and for many people the excitement of space is a gateway uh, to discover the opportunities in the broader science and innovation economy. A, a key focus of my mission at Bayes is, is on clusters and uh, I'm pushing the department and Innovate and UKRI very hard uh, to think, yes, about regions, but not simply to allocate funding on the basis that there's a bit going to each of the government regions, but to think about the clusters that will really drive growth and investment. And I, I would encourage the Honourable Lady Officer, as she's done very powerfully today, to continue to make the case and to follow up with me to make the case that Leicester is at the heart of a cluster. I think she's right about that, and uh, I will be talking to Innovate and uh, UKRI about how we support those clusters over the next few years, and that's about infrastructure, connectivity, skills, data, and planning. Uh, and I'd be delighted to come and visit. Um, the Honourable Member for Sutherland highlighted similar points, and I, I pay tribute to his passion for this as a commitment to opportunity for a new generation. I mean, the Highland closures were a long time ago, but it speaks volumes that people, that, that, uh, that's still a sore point uh, now, and we do need to do more to create opportunities, and I think He's uh, highlighted the opportunity, and as he said, the Honourable Member for Murray, hugely supportive, and it's nice to see a flourishing of cross-party working for the good of Scotland. And the Orbex opportunity is huge, and I join him in paying tribute to local leaders, because for national strategies to work, we do need local leaders to deliver. Uh, I think this is a huge opportunity, and from Goonhilly in Cornwall to satellite manufacturing hubs in Surrey and Glasgow, the Leicester cluster, and up in Scotland, we've got the opportunity in the next few years to do something really significant both for the UK economy, for global uh, science innovation, but just as crucially for a new generation of people in some of the left-behind areas who need to see that they've got an opportunity in the economy of tomorrow. The question is that this House has considered Leicester Space